再开始哦。Do you need a break ball? Wait for the bell. Okay. So, guys, uh, any sign on food for tell people coming here? Oh, I'm. Uh, should I read? Okay, maybe write uh, some, some notes. Stand, yeah, some notes. Okay. Let's start our seminar. And uh, today it's our honor to invite Komo Tsuku Koto san from uh, NTHU and go to here to give this talk to us. And uh, his talk today, the title of his talk today is Revealing Cosmic Star from Formation History with the Akali Space Infrared Telescope. Let's welcome our speaker. So hello, I'm uh, I'm Tomo Goto. I'm at the uh, NTHU next university, um, uh, astronomy department. And today I want to introduce some part of my research at NTHU. So I, my research is in, in variety of field in astronomy, but today I focus on this um, using Akari space, revealing cosmic star formation history using Akari space infrared space telescope. Okay, so the Jian Zhong Yao, Jian Jian Zhong Yao, the Dong Xi Yong, Wang Yan, Yan Jin Shi Kang, Bu Da Da Da. This 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 story maybe you know that. No, yeah. the three important things you cannot see by your, with your eyes. So what I want to see is Jian Jian Zhong Yao the Dong Xi Yong, Hong Wai Xian Ji. If you use infrared, you can see what's important. That's the that's the key point of my talk today. Okay, this is this work is a collaboration with many people. So I want to thank my collaborators first. And especially my team members, so I have uh, two postdocs, something and Getza, they are, they are fantastic, they are very, very talented postdocs, so uh, that's why this uh, research was possible. Also, um, my students, uh, my students, so these are students, um, I'm trying to, most of them are uh, working hard and they, uh, wrote some papers, published papers before they graduated, including uh, master students. A lot of students got some post uh, presentation or post award or presentation award. Um, this is also in collaboration with these uh, students. I also appreciate their contribution. 
And also undergrad students, some of them got a uh, lot of postdoc rights. I think this was the uh, uh, PSRC physics meeting in Jiaodang, I think, last year. Okay, so let's start the talk. The uh, main scientific motivation is in this long history of the universe, in 138, 30 billion years of the history of the universe, when uh, and how much stars the universe form. This is called cosmic star formation history. And revealing this cosmic star formation history is one of the major goals of observational astronomy. And hundreds and hundreds of astronomers are tackling this problem. This, this is a major goal of the astronomy. So where, when and where stars are born? That's our science goal. But traditional method to reveal this, if you use a, build a big telescope, do observation, and then see how much stars are there out there. That's a traditional method. But this method has a problem, major problem. You can, if you use UV, ultraviolet, or optical light using ground-based telescope, then you can only get the lower limit because you have something called dust extinction. Because optical UV light are shoulder weapons, so they are obscured by dust, hidden by dust. So if you're using this ground-based telescope, this is a monocare observatory, you cannot see the obscured part. Then how do you, how do you see obscured star formation? The answer, our answer is infrared. Infrared. William Herschel uh, discovered the light outside of the uh, infrared, uh, outside the, the red light. There's an infrared, something called infrared light. So now, we w I want to take a, do a little game here. We play rock, paper, scissors. And I already have uh, decided it came here. Can you beat me? OK? Rock, rock paper, scissors, if you, you know that. Right? Yeah. Can you raise your hand and then do it together? OK. OK. okay. Rock, paper, scissors. OK, my answer is here. So, paper. <laughs> who has beaten beat me? Uh, who have scissors? Who have who got scissors? Oh, a lot of people with me. Who had the rock? Who had the rock? You, you had the rock? Yeah. Oh, only one person? How can it be? <laughs> anyway, you're lost. You're lost because we don't have infrared eyes. Because if you have infrared eyes, you can see through the dust. So this is supposed to be dust. And that's what we want to do in astronomy. What that, what, that's what we want to do in revealing a cosmic star formation. OK. Then, uh, so this is astronomical case. So this is a nebula. So, so this is an optical picture. If you use a ground based telescope, take optical picture, you see something like this. And then you see black in the center, right? So there's no stars here. There is, there are stars. If you, if you use infrared, you would see like this. There are many stars, right? So this is a classical traditional problem. You cannot see it in optical, optical light, no matter how big your telescope is. This is why we need infrared to see the hidden part of the universe. In case of Orion, it, who knows Orion Nebula? Have you, have you seen Orion Nebula? You, you know, this characteristic three stars are here, right? You can see it in, in the morning now. And then you might think, OK, you never say, OK, there are three stars, and then uh, knees, and shoulders, and head. And then you might think, OK, there's nothing in between. I don't see anything here and here. I don't see anything. Is that true? There's nothing in between here. Let's look infrared and oh, There's a lot of dust here. You just don't see it with optical light. You, you just see it in our eyes. But if you use infrared, there's a lot of things. See, there's an active star formation here. And then also, there's a, you see a round structure here. This is supernova remnant. So supernova explosion happened here uh, many years ago, hundreds of years ago, and exploded, and then expa expanded. This, this also, we, we cannot see with optical light, but if you use infrared, you can see it. So this is 
how much information infrared can bring us. Uh, in terms of galaxy, galaxy scale, so this is a uh, famous uh, spiral galaxy. And then in the middle, you cannot actually see, right? There are too many stars. You cannot see what's going on here. But if you use infrared, you can see through. You can see the more finer structures in infrared. Another example, this is, who knows what is this? And yes, yes, exactly. Andromeda galaxy, our neighbor spiral galaxy. Again, in the center, you, you cannot see, right? There are too many stars, you cannot see. But if you use infrared, you can see much more detail through going through the dust. So that is how useful infrared is. But um, infrared, so, so that's why we made a, uh, we built an infrared space telescope, uh, something called Akari. This is our space telescope. So it's, this is a cartoon, but this actual telescope here in a green room. I'm, I'm dirty, so I cannot go inside, but <laughs> the telescope is inside Queen Cap. Queen. Mm -hmm. And then we, we don't see the space. Is there speaker here? Speaker? Anyway, I'll try. <laughs> to detect the satellite and make sure it's in a correct orbit. That's what I was doing. And then this was in February, so it's cold in Taiwan and Japan, but Chile is not in winter, it's summer, right? And it, it was actually February in Chile, it's a vacation, so, so I was uh, <laughs> I went on beach. Because satellite delays, delays and delays, and satellite launch delays and delays, because you know, you don't want any tiny mistake in a satellite launch. So if there's something is wrong, they just put it off and check everything again. So it was almost one month delayed. So I had a lot of time to spare in G. So that's how I was. I was waiting for the launch. <laughs> not, you know, <laughs> this is part of my job. Okay. So see, this is something called being at the There's a lot of Argentino uh, young people. Anyway, then it was successfully launched, and this Akari Space Telescope did uh, two major things, all sky survey. So it was flying um, in so something called the Sun Synchrotronous Orbit. Because infrared telescope has two big enemies. One is the Sun, and then the other is the, moon. the Earth. Yeah. Yeah? Because Earth is also bright in infrared. So infrared telescope, never want to look at the sun or earth. So they all, so the Akari telescope always look away from the earth, perpendicular 90 degree from the sun, and away from the, the uh, earth. So it's observing this, like this. Maybe I'll show it again. So, you know, you see, it's observing away from the earth. And then as earth rotates, it's gonna do the old sky scan, in once half a year, twice a year. Okay. And at the same time, uh, this field, North Ecliptic Pole, it, it's 
every orbit includes displacement. So there's a very deep observation here. This is called NEP field. I'll talk about I'll talk about the data about uh, in this NEP field first. Okay. So that's the place at uh, which the orbit will always pass. Yes, yes, yes. Because of this orbit, so it's always flying between the daytime and nighttime. So this part and then also this part. Uh, every day, every orbit, it will observe. So accumulate and data gets deeper. And sometimes uh, I have to do the operation. So this is not Houston, Houston, NASA, but we have a similar room in Japan Space Agency. And I have to send command how to observe and download the data every, every time. Uh, what time do I need to go here? Is it lunch time? Because it's flying the border of daytime and night time, right? So, yes, exactly. It's sunrise and sunset, right? So actually, you have to go a little bit earlier to prepare. So I have to go <laughs> at 5 a.m. In the summer, summertime, the sunrise is earlier, right? So sometimes I have to go 4 a.m. So it's a little bit sleepy, but then some like this. And then we got the data. So this is an NAP field, that whole field where we have a deep, deep data. But we had a, uh, okay. And then in this field, one of our telescopes, um, compared to NASA's telescope advantage is we have continuous nine band filters in mid infrared. So this is wavelength. So this is one micron to 24 microns. So this is mid infrared wavelength range. Then, uh, so these are filters where you can do observation, okay? Then, as you can see, in a fairy telescope, we have continuous nine filters, there's no gap. But NASA's, this Spitzer, NASA's Spitzer telescope had a gap here. This was the biggest problem, because if a galaxy feature is in here, then there's no way to observe. If it's here or here, that's okay. But if it's here or here, then NASA's telescope cannot do anything. And this was the biggest uncertainty for NASA's telescope. And then we don't have that uncertainty. We can fix that uncertainty. So that's the advantage of our telescope. Okay. And however, we also had a, a little bit of problem because we didn't have um, optical data. So this is, again, Akari's data. It's um, very wide, across a very wide region of five square degrees. But we only had optical data in this region. And then we do, didn't have optical data in the other region. This, is, this was a problem because optical data would tell us that something called redshift. This is distance to these galaxies. So even though we have um, infrared data for these galaxies, we didn't know, if we don't know the um, distances to these galaxies, we cannot measure the intrinsic luminosity of these galaxies. So that's a problem. And we only have data here. So recently, we fixed this problem by, uh, so, okay. so this is why our data are uh, messy before. Okay. So but recently, we used something called super telescope hypers prime camera. This is this camera. This is, my size is about this size. So mm -hmm. it's, it's very uh, big camera. It's like, like this. Uh, this is a little bit expensive. This is Taiwan dollars. Taiwan dollars, okay. And then it's on top of this super telescope. And this was recently uh, installed to the super telescope. And then what's nice about it, this camera has a very large, okay, very large field of view. And then we took uh, optical data to measure this. So the right hand side is the camera itself. Yes. And uh, is the sensor is CMOS. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, CCD, CCD, CCD. Mm -hmm. And the uh, right hand side is the lens. Okay, so put the camera on the lens. It, lens is also, I think camera is somewhere here. The lens is here. So this is a telescope, and this camera is here. Okay. And then light, from, light comes from the, the top, right? And there's a mirror here, 8 meter mirror. Big mirror. Yeah, it's actually 8 meter, so it's about the size of this room. That's how big our telescope is. 
And then the light comes here, reflects on the mirror, and then goes to the camera. So the camera is here. This thing is here. So inside the camera, there are filters. Yes, yes, filter is in front of the camera, yes. So that we select uh, uh, certain wavelengths to observe. And this telescope is in Hawaii. So from Taiwan, uh, this is you know, Hawaii it's in the middle of the Pacific. And you have to go fly there uh, to make observation. And Hawaii has seven big islands. And actually, Hawaii has a uh, whole mountain, Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa. Mauna Kea is 4,200 meters, so that's very high. So it's actually a good place uh, for, to put telescope. It's called Mauna Kea Observatory. And then, can you see the telescope for this picture? From the front of the top? Yes, yes. Oh, you have good eyes. So these are Mauna Kea Observatory and telescope. So on a clear day, uh, so uh, Obviously, this is at the sea level, and then you can see the telescope. On the and then you just drive up, and then go through all the seasons, because as you go high, you know, temperature gets colder, colder. You see a lot of vegetation, like Taiwan here, because it's tropical weather, but at the, at the top, it can also snow. How's the height of you? Yeah. How's the height of you? But this observatory is 4,200 meters. So it's higher than Taiwan's mountain, right? Yeah, very high. So you can imagine it's cold. So this is super telescope. That's a telescope, our camera. These are America's 2K telescope. This is NASA different telescope. And I showed this picture to my friend, and I said, oh, it's beautiful ocean. It's not ocean. These are clouds. <laughs> and then this is a Maui island, neighbor island. You can see it. On and then in winter time, it's, it's the temperature is around zero degree all through the season. So winter time, sometimes it's snow, and then you can do skiing in Hawaii. That's interesting. And this is me from the solar telescope. Ah, okay. So this is when things go well. But sometimes <laughs> telescopes are broken or some problems. Um, once I flew to from Taiwan to Hawaii Observatory. It's a, it's a long flight, right? You have to change in Tokyo and maybe 17 hours. Not the right flight right now? Not the right flight on Taiwan? There is, there is, in, on certain days, oh, China, China era. Okay. Um, so long flight, maybe 14, 15 hours. And then I get there, and then, okay, let's go to observation. I, I visited the uh, telescope, and then a lady came and, oh, telescope is broken. Please go back. I just came here and go back. Sometimes it kind of happens. So I'm right here. And then so at that time, I, I went with my friend, my collaborator. And then I asked, so OK, we, we all went there, and we have nothing to do because the telescope is broken. And then I asked the collaborator, OK, maybe we can go to the beach and swim. But then I didn't bring a swimsuit, right? Because I was trying to go to the mountain. I brought a jacket. And I asked my brother, did you bring a swimsuit? And he said, yes. <laughs> he even brought a go-go. So he's swimming with a turtle. This is, this is, so at that time, at night, we had nothing to do. So I went, we went to see a volcano or an empty beach or something. But this is a very unfortunate situation. I, I wanted to go to Japan. These kind of things sometimes happen. Anyway. Ah, okay, then uh, maybe I can show you some a little bit of the When that scope is working, the observer is very beautiful. So that's the telescope. This is America's Cape Telescope, this is Hemi Telescope, NASA's Infrared Telescope, this is Canada's Hawaii Telescope. Taiwan also has a share of this telescope. This is uh, America's Gemini Telescope, Russian Hawaii 2.2 meters. So, on a, on a, when there's no problem, the sky is very beautiful there. Because it's 4,000 meters, right? Clouds are below there. Okay, so now, using that telescope, super telescope, now we have, we cover the whole Akari's energy field. So we now have 
both optical and infrared data. So we're ready to do science. Okay. And then, okay, with young people did a fact, sorry. Young people did observation. And this is the HSC data we have obtained. And then, so this is, okay, this is a little bit detailed. This is how we measure the distances to each axis. And then dispersion is something like 3%. That is very good accuracy in, in this stuff. Okay. Then we measure something called uh, luminosity function. Okay. Maybe I feel this is a little bit detailed. But anyway, this we count the number of galaxies and as a function now. So then number density of galaxies as a function of brightness of individual galaxies. And then these are from nearby blue to purple. So this is more distant, more distant, more distant. As you can see, more distant universe has more brighter galaxies. Okay. Okay, so that is that is one result. And then also Akari can do a little bit more. Akari also did the all sky survey. So this is actually cosmic star formation history. And then please look at this red line. It's the one we measured this time. And then you can see from nearby to past universe, this is about 10 billion years ago. Um, universe was creating more stars. So this is cosmic star formation history. At the current, currently, there's not made much creating stars. But uh, about 10 billion years ago, universe was almost 10 times more stars uh, in the universe. Okay, so that's what we, that's one of the results. But uh, at the moment, including our NEPD field, people are building a lot of big telescopes to push this cosmic star formation history more and more in the, to the past. In astronomy, because the universe is expanding, looking at past is looking looking far away is looking at the past because you know, universe was is expanding so that is time to travel to our earth right? so we are building a lot of big telescopes to see more and more in the past more and more distant universe for example this is nasa's jwst uh 6.5 meter space telescope nasa is planning to launch next year this is 30 meter telescope we are trying to build on top of Mauna Kea. Maybe you have heard some pro protest in Mauna Kea Observatory. Um, anyway, one of the goals of the big telescopes is to push it forward. But I think it is because we want to study evolution, evolution is to see the change, right? So it is also very important to measure the, our nearby universe more and accurate, as accurate as possible here. Our current rate of star focus. And this is what our infrared telescope can do best. That I talk about a little bit. So this is a paper I wrote with my postdoc, AJ. She, she was in Taiwan until last year. And in this local data point, there was a monster paper by this famous Professor Sanders, Sanders 03. This is, uh, uh, this, is this paper is uh, different to all the uh, high relative work, more distant work. And it almost cited more than a thousand times. But this paper, famous paper, was using data from IRA satellites that is from 20 years ago. So it was using very old data. But there's only this paper. So people just kept citing this paper as a reference to compare your results. So I want to rewrite this paper. And there are two key points. One is Akari, which is longer wavelengths. And then the second is um, the number of galaxies in the sun. I explain each one right now. So this is uh, called something called acidity thinning. How do we measure the uh, infrared luminosity of individual galaxies? So this is wavelength. It's 
10 micron, 100 micron, and this is France. And previous IRAS satellite, IRAS is European satellite, 20 years ago, only had data until 100 micron here. So they didn't have these two data points. And if you don't have these two data points, then you don't know if the SCD is turning around or continuously rising. So this was a big uncertainty for previous work. But now, Akari, so for, if you look at a blue and pink curve, this integrated infrared light will be a hugely different, right? But if you don't have two data points, you cannot tell you. But Akari, our study, right, has these 160 micro, 140 micro data points. So that's why we're sure that it's turning around. And then if you look at this, if you have these two data points, the blue line is not accept acceptable anymore. So you know uh, it's turning around. So this having this 160 micron data is critical to measure infrared luminosity accurately. But there, is, there should be some uh, general model for you to expect uh, also the, 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 the curve should uh, uh, drop style at some point, right? Yes, yes. So uh, this is this is dust part. It's mostly black body. Mm -hmm. So uh, depending on the temperature, it should peak somewhere around here and it goes down towards longer wavelengths. But there is so the, there is answer, a little bit uncertainty depending on the temperature. If temperature is higher, it's peak is left side. Temperature lower, peak is right side. So okay. And then Akari, uh, so 160 micro is important, and then Akari is the only satellite that provides 160 micro spy infrared data to all sky surface. Okay. And then also, previous paper, Sander said, well, only use 600 galaxies, but we can do a lot much, much better. We use 15,000 galaxies. How did we do it? So we have Akari all sky survey. It's 15,000 galaxies in there, in measured in infrared. So that's, that's extinction free, it's not obscure. And then we combine spectroscopic redshift, these are also distances from this SPSS survey, and then also combine white survey, <coughs> and then 6-year tumor spectral survey. So we combine all these data to Akari data to measure with a sample of 15,000 galaxies with spectroscopic rate, with distances. So the number of sample has increased 20 times, 600 <coughs> to 15,000. So statistically, we are much, much better than Sanders LLP. Okay. Then, uh, so this is, this was possible because we did all sky survey, not in a tiny region. But we survey all sky, we scan all sky, so that's why it's possible. And the method I don't talk too much detail, but um, we have many galaxies and then combine distance, and then for individual galaxies, we do the SCD fit just as I showed in the view graph, and then get the lum infrared luminosity, and then we correct for the completeness, and then we luminosity function that I showed here. So again, this is something called luminosity function. And as a function of infrared luminosity, this box, the so large number is brighter. And this is the number density of galaxies. And of course, brighter galaxies are scarcer, and then fainter galaxies are more numerous. And then uh, let's compare. Our data point in this new paper is black. But if you compare, for example, uh, the let's compare with the red one. Red one is our previous one. Red one is more shaky, right? That's up and down. But because of our sample is much larger, so our black data points are much more smoother. I believe this is the best local infrared luminosity function. This is the best of this time uh, because of the two data. And then, so such uh, this, uh, there's any 
significance of such a distribution? It's significant. Of such a distribution, in fact, uh, you show some distribution. Um, this curve. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is this curve, uh, can this curve be predicted uh, with some model? Uh, or this is just, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, the, the, the shape of the curve. Does it shape of the curve. Uh, carry any significance, any physical significance, or is this a bit? Uh, oh, but that, that's, a, that's very, very good and a deep question. So if you, um, from dynamics, if you just do the n-body simulation, assuming gravitational crop, so there's a random distribution of initial condition, and then there's something called gravity, right? So gravity uh, collapses and make galaxies, make things collapse, and they make galaxies, and then those galaxies sometimes collapse, and they grow and grow bigger, big, make a bigger, bigger structure. Mm -hmm. If you follow that theory, then you get a power law because. You know, gravity is, uh, is self-similar in, in different scales, right? Like the big things, small things, it's just gravity. So, so you expect it, it will be a power. But this is not a power. That's because there's an astrophysical effect. So it's not so simple just, just a gravity. Sometimes galaxies make stars, and it becomes brighter, and sometimes galaxies um, Stop star formation and then become fainter. Sometimes there's called something called supermassive black hole. They make galaxies brighter, and then later they might uh, make galaxies fainter. So there's a lot of complicated astrophysics coming into here, and then it becomes here. So actually, it's it's a good to good hint to understand all these processes. So if you get everything right, you you can change, reproduce this from that, mm -hmm. all these processes. And then this tiny arm, so it is really like a, we often fit this uh, double power law, this is a power law, and this is a power law. So this characteristic scale is also telling us the characteristic scale of those physical mechanisms um, um, that behave differently here and here. We think there's a Feedback from black hole, supermassive black hole, are important here. And feedback from supernova are more important in painter galaxies. And then this may be the telling us this the scale scale where this important mechanism change. So there is a, a lot of deep questions in the shape of this. Uh, okay. So then at the beginning, why I was talking about my goal is measure a cosmic star formation history, right? And then why am I talking about this luminosity function? The reason is, if once you measure the luminosity function, luminosity function is number density of galaxies as a function of luminosity. So if you multiply the luminosity function by luminosity and integrate, then you get the total, total infrared luminosity density. And total infrared luminosity density will tell us about Star formation rate of the universe, star formation rate density of the universe through this famous Kenica radiation. There's a tight radiation between infrared luminosity and then star formation rate density. It's a couple. So, so only in the infrared is relevant? Because, uh, yeah. Oh, that's a good question too. Yeah. I, I'll show, but the okay. contribution from infrared is the large, by far the largest. So that's why we are doing. So, so now what we need to do is integrate this. Okay. Then we know how much stars are born at that time at the universe. Okay. And if we do that, we get this. So this data point is infrared luminosity density or cosmic star mass rate density. Is this was this came by integrating that luminosity point. And then those higher range of data points came from by integrating that diffuse luminosity function as a function of gravity. Again, this is nearby universe, and this is going looking farther away or, pa or past in history. And then again, so again, you see the universe is creating more stars uh, about 
10 times more by 10 billion years ago. And then this point, data point, I am proud that we put the uh, most accurate uh, local data point thanks to our Akari space data set. And then this data point stays the best uh, for in the, in the near future because there's no future Oscar survey in trying to this plant, so Akari will stay the best for probably many years. Okay? And I want to talk a little bit about our future plants in this NEBD field. So, uh, in NEBD field, um, this NASA's James Webb Space Telescope is going to go into space next year. And this telescope is going to observe the NEBD field. Can you remind us the full name of NEP? I'm sorry? The full name of NEP. Uh, North Encrypted Hall. NEP. North Encrypted Hall. So that's the end name. Maybe I need Maybe use mine. NASA's uh, next telescope after Hubble Space Telescope. This is 6.5 meters, so it's almost three times bigger than Hubble. Uh, it, it looks like this. It's interesting. It uh, launched us in a compact shape because it has to fit in a rocket, and it opens up in space. So the mirror itself is also open up, not just the solar panel. It's impressive technology for me. It's like, looks like a you know, cartoon animation. Three times. Hmm? Three times. On error is nine times. Right? Eight? Ah, right, 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 right. Four. In, in terms of area, right? Yes. So, tell me. So, this is opening the solar panel. As an astronomer, I get scared. And this is, you know, billion US dollar mm -hmm. toy, 
And what, what if it's stuck in a space? There's no way. I mean, it's a waste of billion dollars, right? But if I talk to en engineers at NASA, they are very confident. This is easy, established technique. So it, they say it will work. I'm not 100% sure, but they say they are 100% sure. It's a complicated structure, isn't it? Uh, uh, this Shelter? Uh, this is a, yes, a sun seal, so that yes. you know, stop the sunlight. So many layers. Ah, right, 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 right. To to you know, shut down the heat. Oh, because also there are so black body radiation, so they want to uh, reduce. Yes, yes, exactly. So the so so yeah. So this is the sun seal. So the sun is this direction. Mm -hmm. And the sunlight is, 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 is going to heat up the telescope, and that produces noise to the telescope. So to keep, you need to keep the telescope cool, low temperature, and so you want to seal it. Do they bring an air conditioner to reduce the, air, the, the temperature? I am sorry, do, do you also bring the air conditioner? Uh, oh. Yes, yes. Um, so, but only for the cameras. Oh. Cameras, they have a, a cooler. Then, okay, so when this comes, then when this goes up to space, there will be a revolution in astronomy. Just like when Hubble Space Telescope went up. When Hubble Space Telescope went up, like it was the revolution, people were like, whoa, this, we didn't know about this. This is a revolution in astronomy. And that's going to happen next year when this goes up. And then we need to prepare for that. And then, lucky for us, oh, oh, so our Akari Space Telescope, our uh, small test of filters are shown here. And then JWST, NASA's big telescope filters are shown here. It's very similar, right, in mid infrared wavelengths. Yeah. It's very similar. So I'm training my students now with using Akari data. Uh, then as soon as uh, JWST goes up, they can use JWST data and then write a paper. This is revolution, revolution, you know, that with the 6.5 meter space telescope, we'll see so many things we didn't see it before. Even Hubble Space Telescope can see. Like more distant galaxies, fainter galaxies, we never seen, we're going to see it next year. So we need to prepare for that. One example is shown here. So in mid infrared, um, uh, wavelength range, there's a the sh shape of the SED uh, very different uh, from black holes, active galactic nuclei, this is a black hole, and then star forming galaxies. Star forming galaxies have complicated emission lines. Black holes are, are more simpler with a little bit of absorption. So, using these mini infrared filters, these many mini infrared filters, Akari can tell these differences, but JWST also can tell it better. So, so I'm training my students uh, to be able to do that as soon as it launches uh, next year. So stay tuned. For example, this is one example. So um, in NASA Spitzer, Spitzer telescope, so it's AGN, but it's incorrect. Our current data is a complicated emission line here. So it's more like star forming galaxy. So this is where our telescope can do better than NASA's uh, space telescope. Okay, so that's what we are doing now. And then here's a summary. I talked about uh, uh, two sciences. One is a uh, MEPD field. Uh, we combine with super telescopes, new cameras, data, and then we measure the most accurate mean fact luminosity functions in distant universe. And then also, we may use Akari All Sky Survey and then combine these samples, and then we measure the most accurate local infrared function. And this, I believe, is the best in local universe, and then it stays so in the near future, many years. Okay, so that's the summary of this today's talk. And then I want to show the movie of my here, and then I will take a couple of questions. So this, I only show a little bit. Maybe I can find it. Okay, so 
Any questions or comments? Okay, so these days are used to uh, generate the commerce quantization for the commerce field. Right, right, right. So this is a uh, uh, something called uh, laser guided star uh, AO system. So this is not shooting the dust beta in the universe, but it's it's uh, measuring the fluctuation of atmosphere. So it, this laser creates artificial star in the atmosphere, and we measure the how uh, move the turbulence, air turbulence by measuring how much this artificial star moves. And simultaneously, we deform the mirror of the telescope, and then we correct for this. Mineral size, the James Webb telescope, the mineral size is uh, one time three times ten Akali. And so, mm -hmm. how do you, how you will expect, how will you detect in the future? Ah, okay, so there are two things. So, Akali couldn't see like a very, very distant galaxies. Um, so, but with JWST, we can see those very distant, very faint galaxies. So, we can push that cosmic stuff machine history to much further in the mass. The other thing is this this thing, this main thing. So I talked about in the mercy function this one. Right. Tiny pole is yeah. important, right? right? Okay, Akari saw it here in the local universe, but as you go higher red, higher red, it becomes difficult to see the turning point because you know how data is. But JWST can provide data here. And then, as I said, this measuring this turning point is very important. So that's the knowledge that JWST is going to bring. And another important thing is how much black holes are out there. Um, because of the milling and very filters, we can tell the obscure hidden black hole how much how many of them are out there in the universe. And then JWST can do that in a very distant universe. So these are obvious things that data PhD would do. But also there are probably plenty of surprising discoveries from data PhD, such as finding a new population of galaxies or new population of black holes. That's also exciting part. Every time actually there's a serious discussion that every time we build a new telescope or new instrument there is always unexpected discoveries. That's part of the fun doing astronomy. So there will be, I'm sure there will be from JWST. And also the reason why they use the infrared telescope, hmm. not, you, not the visible light, like Hubble, right. because of the infrared can test for this dust. That, that's part of the reason. Mm -hmm. And also another reason is NASA is interested in very distant universe. One of the purpose of building this big telescope is to see more distant universe. And to see more distant universe, we, our universe has something called redshift because of expansion of the universe. The more distant things are moving away from us faster so that they look redder. So the, everything in distant universe, is, the light is in infrared. So we need infrared universe to see the distant universe. So with JWST you can have the better uh, or a finer or a, a finer Hubble concept. We, we can get the finer Hubble concept. Right, right, right. I think so. But uh, it's it's not directly related. But JWST can um, better measurement of the um, uh, for for example, type one A supernova that is used mm -hmm. to measure Hubble constant. JWST can measure it more accurately and then also at more distant universe. So that will bring us better measurement of the Hubble constant. But the Hubble constant program, maybe you have heard of the tension of the Hubble constant. So the measurement, Hubble constant measurement from Hubble Space Telescope using supernova and C5 are inconsistent with Hubble constant measured from cosmic microwave background. They are five sigma away. Mm -hmm. Oh, so, so actually this is not the 
problem of the sensitivity of the telescope. There are maybe some systematic errors that we are missing in one of the methods, or both of the methods, or some physics, something, there's a, some physics we don't understand. So it's actually not the, you know, it's not actually sensitivity of the uh, telescope. I believe even being a bigger, pro bigger telescope, it will probably find a similar result, more accurate as Hubble Space Telescope. So it's, it's, we, we have to check systematic errors, like are we correctly measuring this? talking about uh, mm. to, to get a better understanding of uh, uh, black hole numbers. Yes, yes, yes. So, so, so currently, they, does the gravitational wave experiment right. play a complementary role yeah. in, in this? Yes, yes, yes. yes. That tells us like, uh, how much, how many uh, uh, binary black holes are out there by counting gravitational waves. And so uh, that will tell us uh, and then this gravitational wave is, of course, uh, dust-free, dust extinction-free. So that will give us a complementary way to tell the number of black holes in the universe. But uh, one different thing is uh, those gravitational wave uh, detectors are only detecting very uh, less massive black hole binaries. But what we are looking here is supermassive black hole. So, uh, there's a little bit of mass difference between what we are looking at uh, what they are finding. For, for example, what they are finding is something like 30, 40 solar masses. But we are looking at the, our black holes are something like 10 to the 9 solar masses, billion solar masses. So it's a little bit difference in scale. Mm. Uh, now we have a question? Yes. Okay. So now our infrared tel telescope. A major from about one micrometer to maybe 30 or 50 right. micrometers. Yes. And also we have radio telescope. Right. And the range, the length of this radio telescope is around one millimeter to several millimeters. That's right. Uh, how, how about the gap between the different micro? Ah, right. That's one of the projects that we are trying to do. I didn't talk about it. That's a very good question. So that's this telescope we are planning. So this is something called Spica. This is a next generation infrared telescope. And this measures something like 30 micron to 400 micron. So this is far infrared range. So just as mentioned, in a gap between ARMA and the James Webb Space Database team. So that's, our, that's what we're planning to do. This is 2.5 meter. It's not as big as this, but 2.5 meter. And this is infrared telescope. So it's cooled down to 5 Kelvin. So it's very cool, very cold. You, you need, so, because this telescope is very good. For infrared telescope to improve the sensitivity, the cool temperature is very, very important. So this telescope is compared to NASA, uh, European Space Agency's Herschel telescope, it's 100 times better sensitivity. So that's our next generation uh, space telescope. Taiwan is part of it. We were joining this telescope. So this is Europe, Japan, and a Taiwan project. But uh, we're not fully funded yet. So in, this is in an ESA, European Space Agency's m class 5 <coughs> mission, <coughs> Middle Science uh, Satellite Project. And then there was uh, 20, about 20 proposals to this um, and cross uh, satellite proposed plant. And then this, there will be only one selected. Yeah. And then there was a selection last, last year, uh, or earlier this year, and then 20 were selected to three. And then we're still surviving. We are one of the three. But 
in next year, that this three is going to be one. And I'm not, I am. So this is a European decision? European decision. Oh, Japan part is funded. Uh -huh. And Taiwan, Taiwan's part is probably okay. Well, Taiwan's contribution is a little bit smaller, okay. so we're okay, we are, okay. we are fine. But European part is a big, big portion, and then we need that funding to be the telescope. I'm not sure, but it's a tough competition to, to create a satellite. So, so, okay, so why there's no far infrared telescope because of the technical problem? Because uh, first, uh, it's hard to measure this kind of. Yes, that's right. And second, it's uh, also noise. It's hard to cool it. Yes, yeah. Cool down, cooling down telescope is very difficult. For the yes. infrared telescope, mm -hmm. uh, how, how, how do we know we are looking at the black hole by the daytime of that? Oh. We're looking at the signals from the fusion disk? Ah, oh, that's a good question. Uh -huh. Because uh, we uh, we rarely hear something because this is a high energy oh, seminar, right, right, but right. Uh, we also hope to uh, hear something from other physicists. That would be wonderful. Nice uh, interactions. Right, right, right. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. If you have chance, please visit. Our, give a come to our seminar. Okay. Okay. Sure. Be nice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.